Good morning. This is uh, honors chemistry class, and we are on days August 20th and 21st. Today, we're going to be looking at significant digits in scientific notation. Uh, did you notice that in order for me to see where we were at, I pulled up my calendar. I don't keep it as a bookmark, but of course, I do keep up here my website as a bookmark. And so therefore, when I go into the website, then I can go straight to honors chemistry and I can go over here and either open the calendar like I just did, or I can open up the resources that have the notes, the homework and uh, some labs. By the time you see this, if you're looking at this at the same time as me, there should also be a lab 2.2 on there because of the fact that yesterday or Wednesday, let's call it, you were assigned lab 2.2, which is then due on the 26th. Um, Lab 2.1, classifying matter. Um, I'm actually recording this on Thursday the 13th, so I'm a week early, and I'm already getting the lab that was assigned yesterday turned into me, and they're just superb. So I appreciate how hard you guys are working. Um, I've gotten lots of questions, and so today I also want to try to answer some of those questions, so it's a week later. But you know what? If we're still smoothing out some of our opening uh, roughness, that's okay, because this is new to all of us, including me. If some of the questions that I've seen so far, if I would have uh, would have seen them coming, of course, I would have addressed them at the very beginning. Um, don't be afraid to read the posts because some of the questions I've been answering today um, have been things that I wrote down in those 10 bullet points that said, make sure you read this entire post. And mostly not from chemistry. It's been mostly the regular physics students. Um, but... It is what it is, and I appreciate how hard you guys are working because, as I put on there, you guys really are awesome. This has been a very good start. Um, today, we're going to be looking at, uh, because we're looking at significant digits in scientific notation, there's going to be some toys out that we're going to play with in a moment so you can kind of see the edge of a triple beam balance right here. Uh, that's coming up in a few minutes, too. So we're going to start by going over the homework assignment. I guess there's one more thing I want to say before I do that is also don't forget that uh, from the uh, honors uh, chemistry classroom stream, when I post everything that's on here, you go over to the classwork uh, tab there and you can see it says resources, syllabus, and calendar. So you can pull up the calendar there, but you also have all of the resources here. So um, actually, I already have the lab on there, lab 2.2. Uh, it's not on the website yet because I have to use it from a different document. So instead of it being a Google Docs, it has to be a Power or a Microsoft document. So anyway, those are my issues. Um, I just want to make sure that you guys know where you can access everything. Um, so also website or I'm sorry, YouTube. I guess you guys didn't know that I was a professional YouTuber. Uh, as of the 13th, I only have nine subscribers. I bet you by the time you guys are actually looking at this. This will be up over 100. And once it goes up over 100, then YouTube uh, will start putting some little commercials in the background and I can start actually getting some money for this. Just kidding. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, I know my church, they had to get up over 100 subscribers in order to get some kind of special thing where the videos could be over an hour long or something like that. I don't know. So we uh, made sure that we got up over 100. Um, but anyway, go down into chemistry, and as of right now, don't let's not play them though. As of right now in chemistry, you'll notice if I knew what I was. Oh, there they are over here. There's a pull down tab, and you can see that it has three of our um, of our lectures videotaped there. And then this one I'll be adding to it as soon as this is finished. All right, so. Uh, what do I want to do now? I want to go back into the calendar one more time and just point out that we're going to go over chapter three homework number one right now. And then we're going to have two sections. So you have two homework assignments tonight and they count as two separate homework assignments. I don't need to see pictures of your notes. Yes, I know that if you are looking at the Google slides, you're going to see the answers to the homework assignments. I'm trusting your honesty that you're going to do the homework first and then reference the answers from the slides to see if everything was done correctly. If not, maybe you learn from your mistakes. You're all old enough and intelligent enough that you can probably figure most of the things out yourself. But then you can come back and email me if you're still confused and uh, we can sort through it. Also be patient because when you do this homework assignment, I know the way you guys are. 
Some of you have already asked me if I post things early so that you could do them earlier in the day. That's awesome. I'm not going to post them early, though, because I have to work towards the students who are the laziest, which means the ones who I need the post to come out the minute that the class starts so that they're doing what it is they're supposed to do. You, uh, you efficient people can work with the resources on either classroom or with the website. Um, so what was I getting at? Oh, the doing your homework early. Um, if you do your homework early, um, there's still something else I was going to say about that, and it's not coming up to me. There's going to be two assignments that are due, 7 through 11 and 12 through 15, but I wanted to say something more. You're taking pictures of both of those. You're not taking pictures of your notes. You're being honest. Uh, I don't know. Let's leave it at that. All right. So we did some of these together already. Um, we did uh, the ones that aren't there are the ones that we did already together. Um, so as I go through this now, normally when we're in class together and we go over this assignment, I don't actually go through this. What I do is I do the sets here for candy. So somebody would answer C, D, and E. And then I would say, are there any questions? And we would keep working through the problems and, and only stop when somebody asks a question. But the problem is, is number one, a lot of people don't ask questions because in class maybe they're too intimidated to ask or they just don't care at that moment. And then online, I don't know what the questions are that are going to be asked. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick the ones that I feel like doing, which is not really any until I get down to like O, P, and Q. To me, those are good ones to, for us to practice. So the answers for C through N are up there. Hopefully it makes sense. And of course, if something doesn't make sense, email me. Okay. All right. So in letter O, it says 2MG equals KG. So first of all, we need to know what the unit of measure is, which in this case would be the gram. And then the prefixes stand for milli and kilo. So it was given that we have two milligrams, two milligrams. So I put my blue arrow under that. And then where we want to go is into the prefix of kilo for kilograms. So that's where I want to go. Now I'm going to count the number of movements to get there. One, two, three, four, five, six places to the left with my decimal. So in the number two, we assume the decimals behind it. If it's not written, it must be a whole number. And we're going to go one, two, three, four, five, six. On your homework, if I see it written like this, you're going to bring a tear to my eye. It's one of those tears of happiness and contentment on you doing a good job. On your test, if I see this, you're going to lose a point. I want to see as a final answer whether or not you put a zero in front of the decimal. That part I don't grade. But I want to see this written out neatly because a test is worth the time to write things neatly. If you include the unit, fine. I don't even take off points if you don't include the unit. But I don't want to see the waves underneath the number. In question letter P, now we're going to go from that crazy looking backwards Y, which is the Greek letter mu. So it's kind of spelled where people will say mu, but it's really mu. And we're going to go into just G by itself. So the unit of measure is grams. And we're going from micrograms, which is located here. And we're going to basic units of grams, which is located here. Now to get there, we count the moves. Don't forget that those dots don't have names, but they have place value. So there's three movements to get from micro to milli. In other words, there's a thousand whatevers in a milli from micro. So like if it was grams like this one, we would say there's a thousand micrograms in just one milligram. A milligram is small, like the size of a really small aspirin. So, um, I mean, even smaller than that, really. Um, so know that uh, we're talking about a very small unit of measure at micro. Then we go three more places from milli over to the basic unit of grams, which means then in our number 2.3, you're going to go one, two, three, four, five, six, just like the last problem. You're going to fill it in with zeros on your homework like so. Then letter Q says 3.8 centigrams, and we're going to go into micrograms. So this time we're starting off here, and we want to go down to here. And so we're going to go to the right with our decimal, and we're going to go from centi one, two, three, four places to the right with my decimal. So in 3.8 centigrams, we go one, two, three, four places to the right, fill it in with zeros, and rewrite it as 30, oh, 38,000 micrograms. Now, I don't need the comma there either. 
Okay. I have 3,800. Looks to me like I went one too many, one too few places. If somebody caught that and tells me that I got the answer incorrect before I go over this, they're going to get extra credit. Remember, two points of extra credit whenever you catch my mistakes. Now, I'm going to point something out. I hate to put this on camera. And that is when I'm grading your chapter test, if you're off by a zero, I don't usually mark those wrong because the point of this is to show that you do know how to move between the different metric prefixes. If you're off by one, I kind of usually overlook that. So, um, you know, maybe I was hurrying and missed that extra one there. I don't know. I don't have an explanation. Uh, letters S and U are already on here. These are going from nano. Let's at least do one of these. So nano, 680 nanometers is located right here. If you're sitting there going, what is 680 nanometers? That sounds familiar. The reason why it's familiar is because you see it every day. I know. I'm looking at it right now. There's this red dot shining in my eye coming from the camera telling me it's taping. You guys are seeing it on the screen with the red that's coming off of the screen from the pixels. The wavelength of red light can range from somewhere in the 700s to somewhere in the high 600s of nanometers. So it's like a radio wave that causes your eye to vibrate, just like an antenna. You can't see the vibration. You're seeing with the vibration. You can't see the vibration on a radio antenna either, but it's vibrating because of the wavelengths of radio rather than the wavelengths of visible light. More on that later. We are going to take it from 680 nanometers to the basic units of meters. Don't stop at milli. That does not say mm. It just says a single m. So when I count my places, I'm going to go one, two, three to get to micro, four, five, six to get to milli, seven, eight, nine to get to the basic unit. So from 680, you're going to go nine places, and that's why there's so many zeros there. Some of you might have said when you're doing this homework, you might even been asking me on email, can I just write it in scientific notation? Of course, I would. The problem is, is we hadn't learned that yet. So for us in the homework, we were just moving the decimal like we saw there. All right. Now, like it says there, you don't need to copy down this table. Uh, like it says there, you need a calculator for section 3.3. Honestly, it would be nice that you had a calculator for section 3.2 because I'm going to be using a calculator today and I'm going to explain what it is I'm doing. And I always hate it when I'm in class and half my class doesn't have a calculator yet. And so they just, they're just they bored because they don't know what's going on. So just be prepared. You do need to have a calculator in here. I've been asked questions. What kind of calculator should I get? I would say get the kind that is free. In other words, go to the library and see if you can get a graphing calculator. And uh, then you don't have to pay for one. All right. Now, you don't have to copy this table. This is just to give an example. There is a device inside of an automobile engine from old ones to new ones called a valve lifter. And the job of this is basically the engine has something that times it because what we need is to have a very powerful explosion to occur inside of there that will push a piston and then that piston will turn the car wheels. Okay. Now, in order to get an explosion, you need stuff that's explosive. So that's where the gasoline and air comes in. So those things need to get squirted into the engine. But you can't just leave the engine open because otherwise the explosion is just going to explode outward and not push the piston. So you need to have it a closed compartment. So what we need are doors, and the doors are called valves. All right. So this thing's job is it's timing with the engine to push down and open a valve so that you can squirt the air and gasoline in there. And then with the timing of the engine, it moves back out. The valve closes because it's spring-loaded. The valve closes, and now you've got a closed compartment. Then you explode it. It explodes, it pushes the piston down. But now the problem is you have carbon dioxide and water vapor left over, and those aren't explosive, so we need to get those out of the engine. So another valve lifter will open another door and then push all of that stuff out. And then we repeat the process, and we repeat the process a lot. I mean, think about a car engine. When you're just idling, the car's idling at like 700 RPMs, that means that the doors are opening and closing 350 times per minute, okay, each one. So uh, we're talking about some precision. This thing is moving up and down inside of a little orifice that it passes through. It's moving up and down so fast that the metal upon metal, first of all, has to be lubricated. So that's what oil's for. There's oil squirted in there. 
has to help keep the heat down, but also this thing can't be able to rock. It has to perfectly fit into that hole, that passageway that it's in, and it also can't be too tight. So the size of this is specific to each engine. So therefore, if for some reason you decided to, you know, get your car fixed, maybe, you know, valve lifters can make noise. And so they might replace it. Um, so if they do, they need to put the right one in there. So let's say that they take this out of your engine. They're like, okay, which one are we going to replace it with? So somebody goes out and gets a paint stick and says, well, it looks like it's about an inch wide. Now that's still a pretty good guess because that is about an inch, even though this is just a stick. I didn't actually bring any rulers out here right now, but you guys know what a ruler is. So that's what number two is, is that there's a, that we measured this with a ruler. Now, even that doesn't have a whole lot of precision. Those actually, those two both have about the same amount of precision because of the fact that your educated guess puts it around one inch. Okay. Now, a lot of machinists, a lot of mechanics will have what's called a machinist scale. They'll keep this thing in their little, you know, uh, work pocket and they can use this for just quick measurements just to get an idea because some of them, they're so well educated on their stuff that they can tell by just looking at this kind of carefully with the diameter, they'll know which valve lifter it is. But if they measure it, if they need to be more specific, they might get that what this comes out to be is 0.84 inches. Okay. So now you can see there's a little bit more precision because we have an extra decimal place that's there. Uh, my good dial calipers are at home because I use them a lot. So I still have my bad dial calipers here and I'm gonna explain the difference between good and bad in a few minutes. But these now are nice because when you go to read this is when you clamp down on it, you're not just kind of using your eyes to measure the diameter. You actually have this little set of bars here that will actually tell you exactly how wide it is across this. And you can see good pictures of this online. All right. So then if you know how to read it, which is a difficult thing to read, but not impossible, you can actually come out to a thousandth of an inch. So it comes out to be 0.843. That would actually be enough for this to be the correct valve lifter for, for an engine. And so um, this would probably be all that a mechanic would use. Okay. Now, when they're actually designed by General Motors or Ford or whatever company is making it, they're going to use something called a micrometer. Now, we've already heard of micrometers from our last homework assignment. That's basically where this term comes from. This thing here has a little spinning mechanism and it's slowly closing this. And so I would do the same thing as what I did with the, um, with the calipers is I put this inside the micrometer and once it fits in there, then I'm going to try to find it at its widest point. And then this actually has a way to read it to the 10,000th of an inch. That's what NASA does. It's also what General Motors does because they have to get things exactly right so that cars last a long time. Okay. Now, why don't you copy that down? Nobody's going to ask you any questions about valve lifters or micrometers on your chapter test. What you're going to be asked to do on your chapter test is to tell me how many significant digits are in a number. So you can see that the number of significant digits is basically the number of digits that you see there. Okay. It's almost that easy where it becomes harder is when there are zeros. The zeros is where significant digits become difficult. Okay. Here's some pictures showing you the same kind of thing. And like I said, online, there's a nice picture. Here's a good one here because in the next thing we're going to talk about is precision and accuracy. Those are my good dial calipers at the top that I keep at home. And those are my bad dial calipers that I actually took from my dad because at this point he didn't need them any longer because he had ruined them. His problem was at some point in time, he was trying to measure the uh, diameter of something that was slotted. And so in order to get this to fit down inside the slot, he put them on his grinding disc in the garage and ground down the edges till it was razor sharp. Now he probably did that in the 1960s. And then since then, these have sat in a drawer, just getting abused by other tools that were smashing on top of them. So you probably can't see in this picture as well as you can on the actual picture online there that they don't look right, okay? But if you're reading how it measures here, they still measure precisely. They're just not accurate, okay? So when we know that the dial calipers are supposed to tell us that this valve lifter's diameter is 0.843, these things are such bad shape that these will probably actually tell us that they're 0.743. So it'll still give three significant digits, but not accurately. See the difference between precision and accuracy? Because that's a prompt on your chapter test that you're going to explain that to me. Now, how I'm going to ask you the question, I'm actually going to give you the question ahead of time, is you're going to tell me about this little device right here, 
which is our triple beam balance. Okay, I'm going to ask you to read a triple beam balance on your chapter test, but I'm also going to have you explain to me when these are working properly or not, changes their accuracy. Their precision is always precision. What you have here is a large 100 gram mass that moves. Okay, so if you wanted to mass your your uh, calculator, which I see every year somebody massing their calculator, and I never tell them to stop because you're practicing skills I need you to have. Even though you're doing an experiment you're not supposed to do. So you push everything back to one end and then you slowly move them. So I would start by moving the 100 gram mass. Oh, it didn't fall. So I need to move that. So I'll move it to 200 grams. It still didn't fall. I'll move it to 300 grams and then it falls. Okay, now you can't put it in the middle because we wouldn't know how to read that with precision if you put it in the middle. So if it falls at 300, go back to 200. Then take the 10 gram mass and start sliding it out. 10, 20, 30, it's getting close, 40, 50, it fell. So now I'm going to go back to the 40. Oh, it might have already fallen. This one could be broken. A lot of times when things are up at my desk, that means that somebody broke them out there and then I put them in my little drawer and then fix them at a later time. Maybe I never did that. I think mine's broken. So this is a bad choice for me to be using today. I'll try just a couple more times just to make sure. Yeah, I've made a bad choice. I didn't try this out ahead of time to see that this one here is not reading accurately. Now, why isn't it reading accurately? It's because my well-trained honors chemistry students, they do what they're supposed to. When they go to take this out of the cabinet, they grab it like this. They pick it up by its base. So see how I'm holding it by the sides? Right? When my physics students, who only use these a couple times of the year, when they go to take it out of the cabinet, they pick it up like it's a suitcase. Don't pick these up like they're a suitcase. Because what's happening right now is the entire weight of this is being supported by this little bar right here. This is holding the whole thing up. And then what happens is, is it loses its alignment and it doesn't move properly. So when it's working properly, we should see a good feel of movement. This one does feel like it has a good feel of movement because it's now it's trying to level itself out right. But then once I put something on it, something happens, which is causing it to make maybe like rub. And then because it's rubbing, it can't read properly. OK, so on your chapter test, I am going to ask you to explain to me in terms of a triple mean balance, when would one be precise but inaccurate and when would one be precise and accurate? OK, so one that's precise and accurate is working properly and it gives a lot of significant digits. One that's precise and inaccurate is one that doesn't read right, but it'll still give you all those significant digits. Okay. Now let's look at the opposite. What could we say that is something that is is not precise but accurate? Okay. Well, over here, I've got a bathroom scale. This bathroom scale, I think it's accurate, but the problem is it doesn't have a lot of precision. It wouldn't be good for measuring. Um, calculator mass because the problem is to barely move the dial okay it's good for measuring human mass because now it can deal with the fact that I'm between 170 and 175 pounds right now it's accurate but it's not precise it's not telling me that I'm 172.2 pounds right so the difference between accuracy and precision significant digits are affected by precision accuracy is whether or not the device is working properly All right, there you can see those definitions. In lab 2.3, which is a lab that we will not do until we are back together face to face, and then we will do it. I don't care what time of the year it is. If it's late in the year, we're still going to do it because it's such a good lab. And it does a few things. Number one is it practices the scientific method really, really well. But then number two, um, it also allows us to practice with our different um, measuring devices and um, just kind of see them, see all of it together, okay? So you're going to be massing a, uh, a candle, but like I said, if this is not working properly, there's no point in me pushing this around for you to uh, stare at something that's not going to move properly. Plus also, you know, you might not be able to see it that well anyway. So let's go back to staring at me and then really actually staring at the screen. Um, also with the food scale, uh, next week, you're going to have a lab on density and in your density lab, 
um, you might possibly be using a food scale because you're going to be doing this lab at home. So uh, we'll talk about that when, when the lab write-up is sent out to you. I'll probably have a video that goes with it to explain all that. Definitely, it'll be some pictures. More significant digits tends to go with more precision. So if you can go further past the decimal, you have more significant digits. Okay. All right. Now, here's, a, here's like a, um, a diagram of the three bars of the triple beam balance. And we want to know how to read this because I'm going to put this on your chapter test. Okay. So you've got the candle that's on here. We'll just pretend. I mean, I can put it to these numbers and we can just pretend that it's, it's going even. So we'll pretend that's our candle. You haven't moved the 100 gram mass because that was too heavy. So all you did is you moved the 60 gram mass out to the 60. That wasn't heavy enough, so it's still sitting upright. And then you slid this out till it went past the three by just a little bit, past the first notch, past that three. And then all of a sudden it went, I'll just pretend, it went even, right? So once these little crosshairs line up with each other, then we know that we have as much mass out on these three bars as we have sitting on the pan, all right? So now we have to read that, okay? Pick on the easy ones first. There's no number that goes in the hundreds place. There is a number that goes in the sixties place. Okay. So right now we're at, I don't write this down yet. Maybe I should do it in red so you don't copy this down. So right now we're at 60 grams. Then I go to the single gram bar and it says one, two, three. So really now I'm at 63 grams. Okay. If you were making a, some type of food and you were following a, a recipe, 63 would be just fine, right? The accuracy of 63 is good enough for, for solving the problem. But for us, it's not good enough because we're going to have very, very small changes. For those of you who chose to do the copper part of the lab for the chemical and physical changes, all I wanted you to do was a qualitative measurement. Look and see the color change from copper to kind of a brassy look to it. It's not brass that you're making, you're making copper oxide. But if we could actually mass that in here on a triple beam balance, you would see that the mass changed. It got heavier because it added oxygen into it. But the problem is, is the adding of oxygen from the air doesn't increase the mass by much. So we gotta be able to read past the decimal. So my next thing is, if these are 0.1 increments, right? Here's 0 0.5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. We're back up to four. I'm one increment past the 63, which means that I can say 63.1 grams. If you say that on your labs later this year when we're together, you will lose one point every single time you do it. And the reason for that is because this is more precision of an instrument than just to the tenths place. So what you're going to do is you're going to try to read between the point, between point one and point two. Sorry, I got music going in the background and it's the band Pepper and they were singing a song that was rather naughty. So we turned that down. All right, so, so now we have 63.1 grams. And then what I wanna do is try to read this in between. And on the actual notes online, I made a, like a blow up picture of that so that you can see where this is at. But I think if you're looking at the screen right now, I know our Chromebooks are kind of a small screen you're gonna make an estimation of where you think this is. It's not perfectly on the point one, it's past that. Now, to me, it doesn't look like it's even halfway past. It doesn't look like it's halfway to the point two. It looks like it's before the halfway point. So that's where you make an estimation. So you're gonna tell me that maybe you think the answer is 63.13. Maybe another lab group would look at this exact same thing and say 63.14. Maybe the lab group on the other side would say 63.12. I won't mark any of those answers wrong. I trust your ability to make an educated measurement on that. But what I want to see is that you utilize the device to its full precision. We spent like $120 per triple beam balance for these. I could have just bought food scales for 12 bucks each on Amazon. But we wanted to have precision instruments that would actually tell us that some oxygen bonded to the copper. So please utilize your triple beam balances to their full precision or you will be losing some points. Not enough to really affect your grade that bad, but you know, points is points and we don't wanna hurt anybody's feelings. So read them correctly. All right, now, when you're doing your math, 
how do you know if a number has significant digit if it's significant or not? Rule number one, the easy one, like we already saw with the valve lifter. Any non-zero number is always significant. So if you have the number two as a problem, is that's the measurement is two, then we would say there's one significant digit. If you have the number 200, that also only has one significant digit. Okay, what are those other zeros doing? Hey, they matter. If, if, if I'm gonna get paid for a day's work, there's a big difference between getting paid $2 and being paid $200. So therefore those zeros matter, but they're not considered significant digits. So here's the rules with significant digits is to be significant as a zero, you have to either be trapped or a final zero that comes after the decimal. Okay. This is a final zero, but the decimal doesn't, the decimal doesn't come first. The decimal comes after it. So therefore that zero is not a final zero after the decimal. Therefore this zero is not trapped between significant digits. All right. Now let's go on to the third one. Now, if you're confused, I watch this every year when students are sitting in class and they watch me go over this. There's a lot of people getting up tight because they're like, I don't get it. I don't get it. It's a second example. 2.00. Okay, of course the two is significant. Now we go to the other zeros. Here is a final zero and it occurs after the decimal. The decimal was two places before it. So this is a final zero after the decimal. It is significant. Now that it is significant, any zeros that are trapped between significant digits become significant also. So this zero is also significant. So that means that there are three significant digits there. 2.02, .02. the two is significant, the two is significant. The zero is trapped between two significant digits. That one also has three. 2020, finally here. 2020. This two is significant, this two is significant. Therefore, this zero right here is trapped between significant digits. It is also significant. This zero is a final zero, but it doesn't come after the decimal. It comes before the decimal. Therefore, it is not significant. This one also only has three. One is significant, two is significant, eight is significant. These two zeros are trapped between significant digits, making them significant. This zero is a final zero and it comes after the decimal, making it significant. So that one has six. Remember that if I'm going too fast, you can pause along the way and write stuff down, ingest it, take a deep breath, good energy in, bad energy out. Um, the next one, 100,280, significant, significant, significant. The zeros trapped between significant digits are also significant. This zero is a final zero, but it's not after the decimal, so it's not significant. So that means we have five significant digits. 20.0. The two, of course, is significant. I don't know if this one is trapped, so I look at this one instead. This zero is a final zero after the decimal, making it significant. Therefore, this zero now becomes trapped, so three significant digits. You might have a little bit of trouble on this section when you're getting into your homework uh, tonight. Try it, do the best you can. I do have, remember if you're looking at the slides, I have lots of text boxes to explain things. And then these ones I actually wrote them in blue and green because I would want you to copy them into your notes. Remember, I don't wanna see pictures of your notes. I only wanna see pictures of the homework assignment that you finished. I prefer a picture rather than you doing the homework assignments on Google Docs or any of those things because it's too easy to transfer those around to people. Um, if you're going to copy stuff down and you're not a person who's being honest, I at least prefer that you copy it from me, from the slides. But that's just not a good idea because then how are you ever going to learn this? Remember, this is just the first of two assignments. We've got one more thing to cover today. This one's a little bit easier. Scientific notation is an easy thing to do. When you see numbers, this is an important number in this class, is this 602 with a whole lot of zeros. I don't even know what to tell you that number is. But this number right here is called Avogadro's number, and it's an important number in our class. We would never write it out like this. Way too many zeros. Okay? In order to get enough substance in a sample, you need to have a lot of atoms and molecules and particles there. So therefore, Avogadro figured out a number, and I'll explain why it's such a, you know, why that number. It seems kind of random. There's a reason for it. What's important for us right now is changing it into scientific notation. So what you do for scientific notation is you find where the decimal actually is right now 
in the standard notation, it would be right there because that's a whole number. And what we want to do is we want to put it right there. We want to have one non-zero number in front of the decimal. I think it'll say this in the notes in a second. So this will be written as 6.02, okay? Then you count how many places it took to get from where the decimal is to where the decimal wants to be. So we go 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18, 21, 22, 23. So then what you do is you write that as a power of 10, 10 to the 23rd power, okay? That's the essence of it, but let's listen for longer because I want to make sure you get all of it. Now, you're supposed to also put the same number of significant digits in there. So in the original problem, the 6 is significant, the 2 is significant, and this 0 is trapped between significant digits. So those three are significant. This 0 here is the final 0, but it's not after the decimal, so it's not significant. Therefore, none of these zeros are trapped. Therefore, none of them are significant. So 6.02 has the same degree of of uncertainty, same number of significant digits as the original number. The times 10 to the 23rd is not part of significant digits, it's just telling us where to move the decimal. All right, let's see that with some smaller numbers. And by the way, if you're following this online, you can see where I've nicely broken up the steps here that you could then copy these things down and, and get it all into your notes. And you can pause this right now if you just want to copy it right now rather than going and looking for notes online. All right, write these numbers in scientific notation. So first of all, figure out where the decimal is and then figure out where you want the decimal to be. We always want one non-zero number in front of the decimal. So I'm going to move it from behind the zero to between the three and the seven. So this is going to become three point. Now, the number of places I moved it is three so it's three times 10 to the third power, okay? I'm gonna talk about that first before we talk about the rest of the numbers. Now, to decide whether it should be a positive exponent or a negative exponent, just look at the number and decide whether or not you'd want it in your bank account. Would you like somebody to deposit $3,750 in your bank account? Yeah, so that's a positive. So we put a positive exponent, three uh, times 10 to the third power. Now, the numbers that go in here are whichever ones are significant. So if three, seven, and five are significant, they have to be put into the scientific notation. This zero was not a significant digit, right? It's a final zero, but it's not after the decimal, so it doesn't get to be in the number. In the next one, same thing. We know the decimal would be located there, but we want to put it here. So we're going to put one point, and then our significant digits, they're all significant, so I'll put them all in the number. And then I just count the moves for my power. Four places. And I decide whether I think it's positive four or negative four by looking at it and saying, would I want that in my bank account? Well, heck yes, 12 grand, that's a lot of money, right? In question example, part C, uh, in this one, the decimal, we can see it there. And what we really want is to put it there. So I want this to be 5.10. And the reason why I included that zero is because we know those are significant. This one is significant too, because it's a final zero after the decimal. The rest of these are not significant. They're just placeholders. Remember, to be significant, you have to be trapped. There's nothing trapping them. And not only, you know, it has to be a final zero after the decimal. Yes, these three are after the decimal, but they're not final zeros. So they don't get to be significant. They're just pushing the five down into the ten thousandths place. That's all they do. So to move it to that spot, we're going one, two, three, four places. And then to decide positive or negative exponent, would you want that kind of bank account balance? Of course not. I don't even know if that's possible. So therefore, it's a negative exponent. Last one. Okay, significant digits. These are the three that are significant. Hopefully, that's making sense. We're going to move the decimal right to there. So we're going to make it 2.00. The decimal is located here. To get it from here to there, I go one, two, three, four, five places. So it's a five. Itty bitty number, not a good bank account number, negative five. Okay, got two more things to cover. How about going the opposite direction? These ones are actually easier. Every number you see there is going to be a significant digit, so the answer does have to have four, seven, and two in it. What you've got to decide is where to move the decimal. So negative exponents are not good, so we want really small numbers. So therefore, I'm going to move it three places this way, and it becomes 0.00472. Negative exponents are not good, 
So therefore, if the decimal was located here, I want to go one, two, three, four, five, six. So that's going to add five zeros in front of the three. And whether or not you put a zero out there in front, that's up to you. Bottom one, 4.97. Okay, all three numbers are significant. And then the times 10 to the fourth, that's a positive exponent, means that we want that as a bank account number. So we're going to go one, two, three, four places. That means it looks like I got to fill in two more spots with zeros, 49,700. Going back and forth between scientific and standard notation. Now, last thing, this is where it'd be nice for you to have a calculator. So if you don't have a calculator, you got to get one soon. If you don't have a calculator, go look around. Older brother, or older sister, they might, you know, especially they're not away at college right now. Just, just say, hey, could I borrow your calculator for 10 minutes? And then just don't return it, right? They're not even going to notice. They're not using it. They're not taking a math class this semester. So use it or do the polite thing. Say, I need to use your calculator some while you're home. Could you tell me where it is? And I promise that I will only go and get the calculator and then step out of your room. Maybe you already share a room. I will get the calculator out of your drawer and then I'll put it back when I'm done every single time I promise. Okay, do whatever you need to do. All right, so how you're going to type these into your calculator. This is where it would be nice to be in class because we can actually then all be touching calculator buttons at the same time as we push this in. Okay, so when you go to type this in, you're going to push the button four, then you're going to push the button with the decimal, then you're going to push the button with the four. Then you're going to push the button with a four and now you've typed in 4.44 now you're not going to push the multiplication sign you're not going to do any crazy things unless you have a casio with casio they have a button that might actually looks like might look like this times 10 to the y and that you could push on these graphing calculators what they have is an ee button you're going to push the ee button now why it's an ee button on here but it only shows up as one e on the screen i don't know I'm sure there's a reason for it. We don't care. That's the button you push. Then you push the four again. So that right there says 4.44. Then this takes care of the entire times 10 to the fourth power. Okay, you got the first number in. Then you're going to push the multiplication sign. Then you're going to type in 3.72. Then the EE button again. Then the three. Notice I did not push times. I did not push 10 caret or any of that crazy stuff. I used the EE -E button like a shorthand notation. Okay, now that we've done that, our next thing we're going to do, I'm going to have to like, like I'm typewriting and go down to the next line. Then I push the divided by sign or, yeah, it even looks like that on my calculator. 5.72. Not the minus sign, you need the negative sign. That on this calculator is right where it's down here near the enter. The minus sign is up here on the computation. We want the, we want the negative sign, okay? That's where mine's located. Negative, and then you type in one zero for the 10. The calculator knows that as 5.76 times 10 to the negative 10th power. Now here's why I put two different answers up there. Because a lot of times when we read this to when we read this out loud in English, we say this number times this number divided by this number times this number. That rolls off the tongue like you're in a Shakespeare class. That's not what your calculator hears. What you have to do is anytime you see a number that's in the denominator, you have to use the divided by sign. So notice that right here, I'm gonna draw an arrow down here and hope this doesn't make this ugly. But that right there is the divided sign because this is on the bottom. So we're basically saying this number times this number divided by this number and also divided by this number. And then you just do the whole 1.05 EE5. And now you can push enter, right? Ran out of space. You know what it tells a person, what psychologists say whenever anybody writes and they run out of space at the end of the page? You're an optimist because you optimistically thought you were going to be okay. People who start way over here on the side and finish halfway through, you're a pessimist. You don't believe that you're going to be able to actually get the stuff to fit on there. And so you're pessimistically writing too early. What's better? 
Well, I'm the optimist, obviously, so I act like that's better. But really, the pessimist got everything that fit without it looking fine. Okay? So it's okay. Anyway, the important thing is here, that's divide. Now, somebody out there is thinking, couldn't I just figure out what the whole bottom is by putting parentheses around it? Then I could use a time sign. Yes, but I can't explain that too because I'm going to confuse people. Now, some people who will still stay confused, here's what I suggest you do. Multiply the two numbers on top and get an answer. Multiply the two bottom numbers on the bottom and get an answer. Take those two answers and divide them. Then you'll always get the answer correctly looking like this one here. Okay. The problem with that is sometimes it causes answers to lose their accuracy because you're cutting things off. We call that truncating. Um, that's not a problem in this class. It's a problem in AP chemistry. But the people in this class that are planning on taking AP chemistry, this probably won't be a problem. So therefore, I don't need to address it anymore. Now, significant digits. When I get this answer, there's still one more point left over that this answer here exhibits the same uncertainty as the problem we started with. So what you do, it's very simple. Go back to the original problem, find the number that has the fewest significant digits. All four of these have three significant digits. So put three in your answer. So that means what we're gonna do is we're gonna cut this off at 2.784. We're gonna cut it off to 2.78. We're going to look at the four, though, to decide whether we round up to nine or keep it the same. Zero to four, we keep it the same. Five to nine, we round up. Don't forget that. Chapter three, homework number three, is your second homework assignment. There's three questions. I only have two of them on this slide. The next one will show up next time we take notes. Uh, once again, we are taking notes on Thursday and Friday, which means that now for me, for you guys, it's now approaching the weekend, so you guys have a wonderful weekend.